The purpose of this course uh, is um, to explain uh, the sense in which uh, growth and ectoposis uh, can um, uh, serve as uh, unifying bridges uh, for transferring results across uh, different theories, but also as means for uh, studying a given theory from a multiplicity of different uh, points of view. So uh, the unifying uh, potential of the notion of topos was already remarked by Grothendieck, and um, here is uh, one of his uh, uh, citations concerning it, uh, maybe the, the, the most striking one. Uh, so here is uh, what he says, uh, it is the topos theme, uh, which is this uh, bed or this deep river, where uh, come to be married the geometry and algebra, topology and arithmetic, mathematical logic and category theory, the world of the continuous and that of discontinuous or discrete structures. Uh, it is what I have conceived of most broad to perceive with a fineness uh, by the same language a reach of geometric resonances, an essence uh, which is common to situations most uh, distant from each other coming from one region or another of the vast universe of mathematical things. So, mm, as you can see here, uh, Grothendieck insists uh, on the fact that uh, the, the notion of topos uh, um, in fact unifies uh, uh, situations coming from uh, different mathematical areas, and also he uses a term, in essence, uh, which I find uh, very suggestive and very uh, appropriate in, uh, in this context. So he suggests uh, the fact that uh, toposes are able to capture to grasp an essence of uh, mathematical situations of uh, very different uh, kinds. Um, so um, the unification to which uh, Grothendieck refers uh, um, essentially lies, uh, at least uh, if uh, we uh, stick to what is uh, written there, lies in the fact that one is essentially able to build the same kind of object, a topos, from completely, apparently completely different uh, situations. So the fact uh, that uh, you can build uh, a topos uh, starting from an analytic situation or a geometric situation or an algebraic situation or a logical situation, of course, is something very interesting because if this way of building toposes is non-trivial, then uh, it means that uh, it provides a common language for uh, in some sense, uh, trying uh, to build uh, uh, connections between uh, these areas. Uh, so, in fact, uh, what um, I have been trying to investigate uh, since uh, 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 some years ago is uh, precisely the, the possibility of using growth and ectoposes as means for transferring information between uh, different contexts. It is a very natural idea, after all, given the fact that you can attach the same kind of object to uh, different uh, situations, uh, uh, then uh, it's natural to look for a, a most dynamical way of unifying theories, not just having one language in which we can fit everything, but rather have uh, some kind of more local unification, which happens whenever one is able to build the same object uh, starting from different uh, situations. So the purpose of the course is uh, to um, present a circle of ideas and meet which can help uh, giving uh, substance to this uh, unifying uh, vision of uh, Grothendieck. And it turns out that an ingredient that was missing at the time uh, um, Grothendieck was writing uh, these uh, words, this is uh, uh, my translation in English from Recolte Semai, uh, his uh, autobiographical text in which he, he thinks about his experience as a mathematician. Uh, so uh, Grothendieck, in fact, was not aware of logic in the sense of formal first order logic. So uh, he was the one who introduced the idea of classifying topos. In fact, uh, uh, the book by Monica Kim, his student, is the first um, text in which the point of view of uh, Grothendieck toposes as the classifiers of some kind of structures emerged. But in that context, this was just introduced in a very particular setting. Uh, there were uh, four uh, topos used in algebraic geometry, which were characterized as the classifiers of certain kinds of rings. I will mention this uh, later. Uh, so what was missing is uh, the general framework such that, uh, the general logical framework such that every theory 
expressed in that framework admits a classifying topos. What uh, uh, Professor Borso mentioned uh, today, and I will go on explaining more about that, uh, and uh, he will come back uh, later today, uh, tomorrow, uh, to give more details, more technical details about uh, first order logic and uh, the way classifying toposes are built. So, uh, you see, um, uh, Grothendieck was certainly aware of the interest of uh, the point of view of classifying toposes but he didn't have the formal uh, theory available, which uh, uh, seems to me particularly useful for uh, better understanding the kind of unification and the kind of transfers that uh, Grothendieck toposis can allow. Even though, uh, as it was mentioned in the two courses we had um, until now, there are really many different perspectives of, on the notion of topos, so one is not uh, obliged at all to think of a Grothendieck topos as a classifying topos. Toposes can be built from geometric objects uh, such as sites, or also from other kinds of objects, groups, groupoids, quantals, etc. So this is by no means the only approach which is available on the subject, uh, but uh, it is uh, certainly a point of view that uh, can uh, clarify uh, this, uh, this uh, phenomenon of uh, unification. Okay, so um, in which sense uh, toposis can act as uh, unifying bridges? Well, essentially the key idea um, is, uh, is the fact that um, we can represent a given topos in a multitude of different ways. So when I say representing a topos in different ways, I mean that uh, you can build the same topos up to equivalence in different ways, so starting from, uh, for instance, different sites or different theories or different quantals or, uh, or it can be, uh, say, a quantal or a group <laughs> or, uh, I mean, different uh, uh, concrete uh, entities from which you can build the same topos. So whenever you have uh, such a situation, uh, basically you can try to uh, use the common topos as a bridge uh, connecting these uh, different uh, representations. And it turns out that th this works particularly well when uh, the theories that, uh, um, that you start with uh, have uh, an equivalent or uh, strictly related uh, mathematical content, as uh, we shall see uh, formalized by uh, the notion of classifying topos. But it is by no means limited uh, to that. So what I would like to stress uh, is uh, uh, the, the dynamical aspect of, um, of, of this phenomenon, uh, the fact that these bridges actually allow transfers of knowledge across these presentations, across these theories. Um, I will give uh, several examples of these transfers in the, the course of the lectures. Um, and, um, and I would also like to stress that, uh, as uh, was mentioned by Laurent in his, in his course, even though several uh, quite uh, convincing uh, applications, I would say, have been obtained um, uh, so far, uh, the, the potential of these methods uh, is uh, far from being uh, exhausted. So really it remains a lot to do. It is uh, an almost virgin territory. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, what has been achieved so far should uh, just be seen as an indication of what uh, could come next. And so, at the end of, uh, of the course, I will try to suggest also some uh, research directions to uh, pursue this, uh, this program. I would also like to say that, uh, you see, the word bridge uh, uh, might suggest that uh, we are talking about connecting theories that are necessarily quite different from each other, like a theory belonging to one area and another theory to another area. In fact, uh, it's not uh, limited to that. I mean, one should think of a bridge as just as a, as a dynamical way of looking at a theory. So essentially, um, you see, any theory is not like a dead thing. It is a living organism which uh, uh, develops uh, as far as we discover new knowledge in the theory, which allows us uh, to come up with different languages, different points of view on this. And all of this uh, in the topos world uh, translates into different representations for the same topos or connections between uh, 
hypothesis uh, represented in different ways, etc. And so, uh, in fact, uh, these bridges have turned out useful not just for connecting a priori different theories, but also for studying a given theory by multiplying the points of view available on it. Okay, so the plan of the course is the following. I will start with some background, mostly from uh, categorical logic. Um, and uh, then I will uh, uh, explain the, this, uh, this idea, the, the, the bridge building technique, how it works uh, in full generality, and the underlying vision. Uh, this part will be partly philosophical, uh, but I think it's important to take some time to absorb the vision in order to properly understand the applications that I will explain later in, uh, in the course, uh, because they really arise from a faithful implementation of these principles. And also, if you master the principles, you will not be able just to understand the examples I present, but uh, most importantly, you will hopefully be able to generate many more applications in different areas. So I will take my time to explain uh, the underlying vision. And then there will be a, a list of uh, examples of bridges from different areas of mathematics that I will discuss uh, more technically to show how this technique uh, actually works. And then, as I already mentioned, I will conclude with uh, some uh, perspectives. Okay, now, coming back to the background, let me just uh, briefly recall the definition. Uh, um, so, Grotendictopos, as, um, as we said, is any category which is uh, equivalent to the category of sheaves on, um, on a small site, essentially small site. And the site is uh, just a, a pair consisting of a small category and a Grotendic topology on it. So, as it was uh, well explained by uh, the previous courses, uh, the notion of site uh, can be regarded as a categorification of uh, the usual uh, notion of covering we have in topology of an open set by a family of sub-open sets. So, instead of uh, working with um, uh, the... Uh, the lattice of open sets of a topological space uh, and consider the families of uh, open subsets which uh, cover a certain open set, one replaces this uh, with uh, an arbitrary small category and uh, will specify a certain collection of uh, uh, families of arrows going to a given object subject to certain condition which will uh, define a notion of uh, growth and topology. And once uh, this is given, one will be able, as we, as we saw, um, to define sheaves on, uh, on such a site in, uh, in a completely formally analogous way as one defines sheaves on uh, topological spaces. Then uh, we also talked about uh, geometric morphisms of uh, toposis. <coughs> so a geometric morphism is just a pair of adjoint functors. Uh, so it is written uh, in the traditional way. So uh, we have the, uh, the, the direct image functor, uh, which, goes in the same, uh, which goes in the same direction as it is written uh, uh, the morphism, and the inverse image functor, uh, which is required to preserve finite limits. Notice that the preservation of arbitrary colimits from the inverse image functor is guaranteed by the fact that it has a right adjoint. Okay? So the key condition is the preservation of uh, finite limits. And of course, uh, one key example of geometric morphism is uh, the inclusions of uh, toposis of shifts uh, in uh, the corresponding uh, pre-shift toposis. The inverse image in this case uh, is given by the shiftification factor, also called associated shift factor in, uh, in the literature. Okay, so all of this we already know. Now, uh, let's talk about Toposphoretic model theory. So this is a subject that has not yet be uh, been treated formally in uh, the courses we had so far, but uh, tomorrow, in the course by Francis Borsot, uh, there will be details about all of this. So today, I will just uh, uh, remain on uh, some basic uh, ideas because he will give uh, the, the details uh, tomorrow. Anyway, what I would like uh, to say is that uh, thanks uh, to the rich uh, categorical structure present on a Grotendic topos. So we saw that uh, any Grotendic topos has uh, 
basically everything one could dream of. <laughs> it has uh, limits, co-limits, exponentials, uh, even a subobject classifier. So we have this extremely rich categorical structure, and this allows one to consider models of any kind of first-order theory, and not just first order, in fact, even higher order, because I have talked about exponentials. So you see, we can even consider higher order uh, type theories, for instance, in a, in a topos, even though this is not uh, the focus of, of this uh, course, but I would like just to mention that. So uh, anyway, uh, we can consider models of any kind of first order theory inside um, a given topos. So what is a model? What is a theory? So by theory, I just mean a list of axioms in a given formal language. So first order means that uh, whenever there is a quantification occurring in uh, the axioms of the theory, which could be a universal or existential quantification, this is restricted to the elements of the sets or objects which interpret the sorts in the signature of the theory and does not concern uh, higher order constructions. So one can just quantify basically over elements and not over subsets or higher order constructions on elements. So that's uh, why we talk about uh, first order. Okay, so first order theory, you just think you have a, a, a formal language in which uh, you have sorts, function symbols, and relation symbols. So for instance, suppose you want to formalize, uh, so normally uh, languages signatures are denoted like this, uh, sigma. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, suppose you are in the theory of rings, uh, then uh, you have uh, these uh, function symbols uh, plus uh, and uh, product to formalize these uh, binary operations. You have the constants, zero, one, and if you want, you can introduce also the, the minus, so since you have a, a group, an abelian group, um, and, uh, and you don't have any relation symbol in this case, because you just have functions. Uh, if you want uh, to formalize, for instance, the concept of an ordered set, then uh, you, have, you will have no function symbols, but you will have a relation symbol, a binary relation symbol for the, uh, for the order. This is just, I'm not being formal because uh, uh, tomorrow uh, it will be formal, but just to give you an idea. The sorts are just the kinds of individuals uh, uh, that the theory wants to distinguish. So for instance, if you want to talk about a ring, you just have one object, so you have one sort. Same thing for groups. But for instance, if you want to talk about the concept of a vector space, you want to distinguish between the field and the vector space, and so you will have two sorts. Similar thing for the concept of category, you will have objects and arrows, and it's natural to distinguish between them, so you adopt two sorts and so on. So uh, this uh, is just uh, the intuitive thing. Okay, so, uh, so given such a signature, then you can uh, form, uh, you, can, um, you can write things in this uh, formal uh, language, uh, starting from uh, variables for each of the sorts. So if A, a is, a, is a sort of, um, of, the, of the signature, you will have an infinite stock of variables of that sort available. Starting from then, uh, you first build the so-called terms. So a term is just uh, something that uh, you obtain repeatedly applying function symbols to variables, just a finite number of times. Mm? So for instance, in the theory of rings, uh, something like this will be a term. Okay. Uh, then, uh, starting from terms, you build the formulas. The formulas are uh, all of this kind, relations applied to strings of terms or equalities between terms. Okay. So suppose you are in the theory of ordered rings, then something like that, you see, this will be a formula. So the formulas of this kind are called uh, the atomic formulas. And these are the simplest formulas you can build in a first order language. And then starting from them, you just apply the connectives uh, and, uh, the, and the quantifiers, which uh, I wrote here, to form inductively more complicated formulas. And then you obtain the whole class of the first order formulas. Okay. And uh, then uh, if you have a formula, uh, you will interpret uh, so in a formula, you will have uh, some variables, 
And you will have to distinguish between the variables which occur freely in the formula or quantified. For instance, if I write, if I add here a quantifier, so there exists x such that, so the, the, the variable x in this formula is bound, okay, because it appears quantified, while all the other variables are free, okay? So the distinction between free and, um, and bound is important when we talk about uh, interpretations of formulas and also models, because um, if we have a formula with uh, these uh, free variables of uh, these um, sorts, uh, then its interpretation, which is denoted like this uh, in a certain semantics, uh, will be a subset, or more generally, a subobject of, uh, of a Cartesian product. See, it will be this, uh, of the Cartesian product of the interpretation of the sorts of the variables involved. Okay, so just keep in mind this. So this notation is the interpretation in, in M, which is a semantics, a, a model. Yes? Ah, a little bit higher. Or, um, okay, so maybe just I, I erase, um, well, for the moment the problem is already there, so. Okay, anyway, um, let's erase everything and I will be careful not to write it down again. Um, Okay, so, uh, okay, so if you are familiar with uh, the way uh, we can uh, interpret first order theories in, uh, in the classical uh, set theoretic setting, uh, I would like to tell you that you can mimic that in an arbitrary topos. So you can define the notion of a model. A model is just a structure in which the axioms of the theory are satisfied, just that. So for instance, a model of the theory of groups is just a group, okay? So here, uh, the, the importance is uh, to keep the syntax and the semantics uh, separate. So you see, uh, it's important because a given uh, syntax can have many different models. So it's important to, uh, it is uh, the one of the keystones of, uh, of logic, the fact of separating the, 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 the syntax and the semantics, uh, and at the same time studying the, the, the relationships between them. Anyway, so as in set theory, sorts are interpreted as sets, uh, in topos theory, sorts are interpreted as objects, uh, function symbols are interpreted as arrows, and the relation symbols are interpreted as uh, subobjects. And then one uses all uh, the rich uh, categorical structures structure present on a topos to be able to meaningfully interpret all uh, the more complicated formulas. For instance, so suppose that I want to give a meaning to uh, the conjunction of two formulas, I will use uh, pullbacks to interpret uh, this, because I will have a subobject which interprets the first formula, a subobject which interprets the second, and I will take the pullback of them to, to get uh, the interpretation of that. But more details will come tomorrow, so I don't uh, uh, stay on that. But, um, uh, okay, for the moment I would like to um, to uh, remark that uh, the possibility of uh, interpreting uh, theories, considering models of theories, not just uh, in the classical set theoretic world, but in, in every topos, is uh, something really marvelous and fantastic, because it uh, opens a lot of perspectives. Instead of having just one fixed universe, we dispose of infinitely many universes, and so it makes sense to look for possibly one universe, which uh, turns out to be more natural than the others, as a point of view, as a context, for investigating the theory uh, we want uh, to study. Mm? So, just one remark, uh, since we can consider models of um, a given theory in, uh, in an arbitrary topos, I will use this notation, T mod in E, to denote the category of models of a theory T in a, in a topos E. So, it makes sense to wonder, okay, we have a notion of morphism between toposes, and we remarked uh, that uh, algebraically, or at least from the point of view of classifying toposes, the, the direction, uh, I mean, the part of the morphism that we are interested in is the inverse image. So we wonder whether the inverse image will transform models uh, of uh, 
our theory in the topos F into models of the theory in the topos E. Okay, so we wonder whether for any theory T, this is always the case. And the answer is no, not in general. If you take an arbitrary first order theory with uh, whose axioms involve all the quantifiers and all the connectives I mentioned, this is not true. This is why, uh, this is because uh, uh, the interpretation of some of the connectives I, I used, uh, such as, uh, for instance, the implication and the negation, or also the universal quantification, the interpretation of this uh, uh, does not involve uh, exclusively finite, li finite limits and arbitrary colimits. And uh, we remarked uh, that, uh, uh, in general, uh, these uh, inverse image functors of geometric morphisms of toposes only preserve uh, finite limits and arbitrary colimits. So we will be forced to restrict uh, to a certain class of theories whose syntax has a particular form. And this is uh, what is uh, called uh, geometric theories. So uh, a geometric uh, formula over a given uh, first order uh, signature sigma is any formula built from uh, atomic formulas by only using finitary conjunctions, infinitary disjunctions, and existential quantifications. So this is uh, what a geometric formula is. Uh, I would like to remark that unless in classical first order logic, when there are finitary requirements, usually, at least, uh, I mean, traditionally, logic has uh, always focused on finitary theories. Here, we are allowed infinitary disjunctions. By infinitary disjunction, I mean disjunctions that uh, can be indexed by any set without any restriction on the cardinality. So this is uh, very important because it makes uh, this logic actually pretty expressive. It, uh, it allows uh, one to express, uh, ah, thanks, okay, sorry. <laughs> It allows it to express uh, uh, many notions that uh, would not be uh, expressible in uh, classical uh, finitary first order logic. S uh, simple, yes? Uh, can you tell me back? Oh, wait, 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 questions? Ah, okay. <laughs> can you tell me the type of the semantics functor? So does it go for, do you think, uh, or do you interpret theory T as a category and then the semantics functor is from T? I would like to transform every model here into a model there by applying this uh, functor. So what do I mean? A model consists in giving for each sort an object, okay? So for each sort I will have an object and here I also want to have an object. And so I wonder whether the object which I obtain by applying F upper star to that object will be uh, the, an object which uh, together with all the others will form a model. That's the point. And uh, together, of course, with the function symbols and, uh, yeah, and all the rest. Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody else? Other? No. No questions? OK. Let's go. Uh, OK, so, mm, so a simple example of uh, a notion which uh, requires an infinitary disjunction to be expressed if we don't want to, uh, to go to higher order is uh, the notion of a nilpotent element of a ring. You see, if you want to express uh, this property, you take an infinite, ah, this is uh, even worse than the other, so, uh, yeah. Ah, maybe I, I should, um, it's me that, uh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, very good, okay. So, if you want to express this, you see, you take a disjunction over all the natural numbers uh, of uh, x uh, of n equals zero. Okay. And you see, there is no way you can express uh, this property in... Uh, ah, please, yes. There is uh, yeah, one question there. Okay. Um, can you... Uh, is there any... Um, can you uh, make disjunctions over a class of... Um, uh, 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 no, 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 not no. over a class. No, this is a very important thing. Uh, everything is uh, taking place over sets. So when I talk about classifying toposes, I talk about classifying toposes over the topos of sets. So the parameters should be objects of the basic category. So they should be sets. So I am not allowed to take uh, disjunctions over uh, proper classes. No. So for instance, you cannot express like um, an the, the theory of an arbitrary complete lattice, right? 
an arbitrary complete lattice well complete lattice you will have this is another thing because you will have an operation which uh, has an infinite arity so this is a slightly different thing this will be uh, prevented from the uh, by the fact that um, uh, the operations the function symbols that are allowed in first order logic they should have a finite arity because if they have infinite arity the interpretation as i mentioned well it it has been erased but it was a sub object of the cartesian product of the m a1 m a n so if this cartesian product is infinite then it will not be preserved by inverse image functors of geometric morphisms because it will be an infinite limit and not a finite limit. So we are not allowed uh, operations with uh, arbitrary arity. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, another question. Ah, okay. Uh, just a short follow-up uh, to the question and the answer. Uh, in some cases, you can reformulate expressions using classes in a way that you don't use classes. For instance, one definition of a complete lattice is to say it's a lattice, and for any index set i, and for any i-index family of elements, there's a supremum. So now you had a large quantification over all sets. But you can also just say for any subset, there's a supremum of that subset. And now you avoid it this large quantifier. Mm -hmm. But still, the formulation will not be geometric because taking the power set is not geometric. Yeah, you, by using the power set, yes, of course, you can uh, talk about that, but it is an higher order uh, construction. Okay, now, uh, important remark, many of the theories that uh, naturally arise in mathematics uh, I mean, if they are first order, um, it turns out uh, that they are often geometric. I mean, I don't, don't ask me why, but uh, um, it's a fact. Uh, in any case, if it doesn't uh, happen, it is always possible to turn a finitary first order theory into a geometric one without uh, changing the set-based models. So we just have to enlarge the language, the signature of the theory, in order uh, for uh, any uh, first-order formula to, be, to become uh, equivalent uh, to a, a, a finitary geometric one in, uh, in the enlarged language. So this is a process which is called uh, Morleyization, um, and uh, it can be useful uh, because it is a unique form a construction that can be applied to any finitary geometric theory and uh, which uh, from the point of view of the set based models and more generally from the point of view of all the models in any boolean topos uh, it will uh, keep exactly the same but in arbitrary toposes in which uh, the uh, the complements of arbitrary subobjects don't necessarily exist uh, it will be different uh, but it can be something useful for model theoretic purposes i mean uh, if one wants to to study for instance uh, general uh, properties of um, of the first order theories which are not geometric, it's uh, useful to apply this construction uh, to get a geometric theory, then to study this theory using uh, topospheretic techniques and then come back uh, to extract information about the, uh, the, the original uh, first order theory one has started with. Okay, um, maybe uh, tomorrow there will be more uh, details about uh, that or... Uh, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mi missed it. Uh, I I don't understand. No, no. I missed it means this uh, nil potency. You were saying something and maybe it diverted. I missed it. What what is the thing you were saying regarding nil potency? Yeah, I'm just saying that uh, this is a this is a geometric uh, formula. This is a geometric formula. So a geometric theory is, uh, is something uh, uh, which, uh, uh, I mean, the definition I is there. I mean, is any theory whose axioms can be presented in this form. I mean, they are implications between uh, geometric formulas. So here I have used this uh, sequent notation, but uh, the meaning of this notation is just um, that um, uh, this means for all x, phi, and tails, y. Okay, so uh, ah, maybe you don't read. Okay, let me write. Uh. 
here okay so um, so the meaning of that is just uh, for all x phi and tails psi okay and uh, and x is just uh, a, a finite collection of, of variables which contains the variables that are free either in uh, the formula uh, phi and uh, or in uh, in the formula psi Okay, so um, uh, let's uh, go on. Uh, a very important construction that one can perform uh, starting from a geometric theory and which will allow us uh, to canonically build its classifying topos is uh, uh, that of uh, syntactic category. So this is something which was introduced in uh, the book uh, First Order Categorical Logic by Mackay and Reyes in 1977. <coughs> Okay, so how does it work? Um, uh, well, it is uh, a first step to, uh, in some sense, incarnate the mathematical content of our theory T. And I would like to stress that T as an object is something completely unstructured because it is just a list of axioms in a given language. So you see, it is not an algebraic entity at all. So this construction will be a first step for, uh, in some sense, uh, incarnating algebraically the the mathematical content of, uh, um, of uh, a geometric theory T, because it will be a category, so a, a sort of algebraic uh, uh, kind of uh, object. So uh, this category has, uh, has objects, uh, the uh, geometric formulas uh, in a given context. So a context is just uh, a list of, uh, a finite list of variables which contains all the variables occurring freely in the formula, okay? Uh, so it's, it is not limited to just the free variables of the formula. It can contain more of them, because for technical reasons, it's important to have this flexibility, to consider a formula which has a certain number of free variables, but with a bigger context, okay? So the, um, uh, the objects of uh, the syntactic category are things that are denoted like this, this is just a very formal uh, construction. So we have a geometric formula over the signature of the theory in a certain context. And here, of course, I use the vectorial notation because this uh, will be a, a tuple of, um, of variables, uh, possibly with different sorts. Okay, and of course, I want to consider these uh, objects uh, up to renaming equivalence. Okay, uh, this is clear. Uh, okay, now uh, the arrows are uh, much more interesting <laughs> in this category uh, because, uh, you see, uh, for the definition of the object, I have just uh, used the syntax. I have just referred to the syntactical structure of phi, while to define arrows, I am using a notion of provability in the theory. This is something I haven't mentioned because it is something that you can easily imagine. I mean, uh, when you do logic, you separate, as I mentioned, syntax and semantics. So in the world of syntax, there are deductive systems. Deductive systems are what allows you to make inferences. So starting from certain uh, starting points, which are called axioms, which can be generic uh, uniform uh, axioms, uh, which are part of the logic, uh, and specific axioms of the theory. These are the starting points, and then there are rules of inference which allow you to deduce a certain sequence from other sequences. So a simple example is the, this rule, which uh, you can uh, uh, immediately agree, you see. Uh, if phi entails uh, psi and psi entails uh, uh, entails uh, key, uh, then you have this. Okay, just as an example of yes. Uh, 